being treated under international court. Clear? So have you gone in this manner? No. Um, Good, you are in the right direction. You are in the right direction. You can't because it's a recent phenomenon plus it is Nigeria. What I suggest is deriving your legal analysis, you can take the help of jurisprudence from various countries. Please look at Ireland and England. Lot of students from Nigeria have migrated and undertaken PhD and LLM studies. Just go through their websites and see whether they have worked at it under refugee law or under human rights law or international humanitarian law, okay, so, or international criminal law to be precise. Or has this been treated under human trafficking as a broader hold all idea within which disappearances have been treated? Because we do not know why disappearances are being uh, made in the first place. What is the purpose of this disappearance? Yeah, 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 yeah. Second is how it is done and uh, instances of that. I mean, if it is reported with the newspapers or if there is a systematic study conducted by an international NGO like Red Cross or someone, is it there? Amnesty International, okay. Yeah, so I'm just following the logic. And if that is the case, what are the recommendations they have done? Based on that, you review the international law. International law will mean uh, international criminal law, it will mean uh, United Nations law, it will mean some of the regional agreements, regional treaties and uh, regional in Europe, regional in Latin America, uh, try to do a comparative law analysis, you know. Uh, one is municipal law analysis, second is comparative law, third is global law analysis which is under the UN. And then you derive certain principles, that is the entire thesis. But in literature review you bring it to that point that you have seen, but how Forced disappearances have been treated here, how it is inadequate. So there is a need for a separate guideline or there is a need for a separate treaty or treat it as one of the provisions under the existing so and so treaty. So establishing that basis is the contribution of your research and then giving the guideline is another original contribution. I hope it is clear. Yeah, yeah. So this is how sometimes you may not find ready made literature. You will have to derive the literature. That is why we are saying and please go through the studies which are done in this line in trafficking or other areas because they will provide you from the literature what we said earlier, the method, the location, the approach, the style because you are, you are venturing into something which no one has done. So go by logically similar studies, clear? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Because what the idea of informed consent is one of the chips in the medical ethics area. Now, uh, uh, consent per se in legal area is always dealt with the ability to form an opinion, which is always associated with age. So you can derive that principle from various laws where age has been the major factor. So adolescents being in the threshold age of age of consent, which is universally recognized, so you can identify which are the different ages of consent. Law Commission report is there which is talking about how there is a divergence of opinion. So establish informed consent in medical ethics and medical law. There is also medical law. Second is establish the connection between that and adolescent's right to consent or adolescent's situation of consent. Establish how different jurisdictions have dealt with it. Establish how Indian law has not uh, 
created any kind of guideline. ICMR guidelines and other guidelines are very vague about it because usually it is presumed that there is a next friend who gives this consent. And this next friend is usually the parent. If the parent is not there, then the court appointed legal guardian. The assumption is that the state is the guardian in the final analysis. So how from actual cases, various cases which come under medical negligence and other cases, if you can establish how this has been vitiated in reality because there is no strict guideline or pro forma. And you can develop such a pro forma or a guideline based on other country practices and perspectives. So your literature review will be transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. There is nothing wrong because there is no other source that you can get. You can also talk, I suggest all of you, even you, if you can get by email or by personal interview or by telephonic interview or by written exchanges, establish that uh, ethics, you know, when you're involving human subjects in any form, you have to follow certain ethics, you have to uh, ensure their confidentiality, non-disclosure. There are so many conditions which we have guidelines for. You can collect it from Rupal. Universities are to authenticate it. If I suggest all of you, please take an expert opinion in your area when you are doing the data analysis, all of you who are doing in whatever field. If, I mean, these days emails are easily accessible by people, email to some of these people, ask these questions, quote their opinion, and also give the date on which it was given. And when you are requesting these people, you always send your undertaking that you are going to abide by confidentiality and you are going to abide by privacy and you seek their consent to disclose their names. If they don't give the consent, then you can vaguely mention that according to an expert that this researcher interviewed via email or via telephone. Nowadays, Skype is there. So it will be a good initiative for you also to get to know how the experts are established and how they are talking. And that will add an empirical element to your research that you have used one of your cognitive approaches to find an important data and to add to the quality of research and authenticity of data. So that also I suggest because Pune is having quite a number of uh, medical negligence experts. We have Dr. Kakade who was my PhD student who is an orthopedician. He can uh, talk to you, but if you are looking at psychiatry, he can help you with uh, some expert. Physician also, because in other uh, jurisdictions, general physicians are also entitled to be uh, dealing with, uh, with the consent issues. Yeah, so, so please. Yeah. Surely, surely. Any other question? Yeah. Coming back to the point of Anish, he's mm. talking about the ICC. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, if we take a, like, a look on the uh, ICC one, it's an uh, uh, ad hoc court mm. created only for the contemporary mm. uh, you know, period. Is it possible to create an ad hoc uh, body out of an ad hoc body if the ICC is an They can create a committee out of it to deal with forced disappearance. How come then the ICT got like uh, signatories or wrong status like state members? No, no, no. It is not like that. Uh, International Criminal Court is not an ad hoc body. It is a concept. It's a complete court. But each time it creates a court to deal with that. That is why there is a memorandum of, uh, I mean, there is a memorandum, what, what do they call I can't exactly. There's a contracting parties which sign this, you know. Because these are, you can't have a Netherlands expert coming and talking in Rwanda on the situation. You have to have experts from that area or people who have studied that area. Like my friend went as an expert in one of the courts in Rwanda. Now for her, because she was a practicing barrister who went on the United Nations body, so she was able to give a first-hand account of what went on there as a witness and as a person uh, knowing the situation in depth. That is why, that is why it has an, like how even International Court of Justice has got ad hoc judges, you know. Why do they have ad hoc judges? Indian judges are ad hoc judges whenever Indian matter is discussed. Like we had the fam infamous case of B.P. Paul as the ad hoc judge in the right of passage case. I mean, when the Govan military continued its uh, presence in Goa, uh, Portuguese military. The issue was taken up in International Court of Justice. Can they have a customary right of passage over a foreign territory, you know? So that time an Indian judge was there on the court because Indian situation has to be understood in a complete manner with the Indian judge, something similar. So it is not the question of whether an ad hoc court can create ad hoc court, whether the court can delegate, extend its jurisdiction by creating a localized arm of the court. So it is more of a question of 
expanding jurisdiction. It's a, like an off-campus center of the university. I can't run a law school in Hyderabad, physically difficult for me. So I create a law school as my off-campus center, a center which is outside my campus. But I try to percolate all my best practices there, something similar to that. Because over there, my faculty can't go daily and run classes. So I see that same standards are followed by the faculty who are locally available, something similar in the court context. It's like the, in the earlier, we have these benches, you know, circuit benches of high court. Uh, we don't call it circuit because same judges don't go on a circuit, but they have a bench there where there are separate set of judges looking after that area's uh, issues, but with the same understanding and the same protocols which the main high court follows, something similar. I hope that question is clear. Now, about the issue that you are talking about, an issue which is not within the purview but surfaces later on, then you have to create a committee. We call it as fact-finding committee. No, the, no, no, no. Yeah. Shall I answer that question? Why International Criminal Court cannot be permanent? Answer that question. All of you, you have studied Austin. You know why? It is like who will bell the cat kind of question. The powerful nation which is there. Yeah. I don't know if you can call it weak or strong law. You mean victor's court? No, it is not victor's court necessarily. Here, we, who is the victor when Rwanda has got its own internal uh, people fighting? There is no victor. There is no, they, Everybody is a loser there. It is not victor's. Nuremberg is victor's, but not all other cases. Tell me why. Why we can't have a permanent criminal court? You think of your own criminal court. There is a prison, right? And then there is what? There is a police. Then. Uh, implementing the punishment, the prison police, separate police. Do we have something similar to that in international law? There is no supranational government. And criminal law is the law which has those sanctions which have to be implemented by the government. And government is a party. That is why we use the word tribunal in each case. Because it is more of an ad hoc sitting in that particular situation of a crime which is universal and international as per the dictat of the Rome Statute. Now we are saying it needs to be expanded to include others. So you suggest in the line of what we said about human trafficking, you suggest that Article 6 has to be expanded and it has to have this is, disappearances. This is, for example, a case which happened in the time, yeah. which is not in an time. Absolutely. The ICC has absolute competency to start from a case like the prosecutor for violence, uh, leaders or actors who are abducting people for crimes against humanity. Yeah. yeah, it should, yeah. it should. So make that argument on the basis of this human trafficking uh, logic. Well, even now, human trafficking doesn't have universal jurisdiction. You, because of the lack of human, uh, universal jurisdiction and lack of such mechanism, you trace, the, uh, because human trafficking has got nexus through many states. I mean, Bangladeshi girls are traced, Nepali girls are traced in Pune, in Bangalore. Who, who were just going to school, somebody abducted them, put it into the racket and brought them here. Somebody pretended to be a boyfriend, befriended the girl and then transported her to India. Military general's daughter. We have had such instances reported by our police. So how do you deal with this? Because the moment the border is crossed, the law is different. So that is where universal jurisdiction, your issue. Universal jurisdiction issue is very, very important, especially on crimes against humanity. And there's a need for expanding the scope of these crimes. At that time, they considered from moral perspective, purely from ethical perspective, certain crimes as crimes against humanity. Because they felt it is affecting everyone. Morally, it feels you, it makes you feel averted. But today, it is not like that. It is a question of effectiveness of the law, execution, because of many nations being involved. And that's exactly where forced disappearance need not be in the situation of war to be part of the crime, uh, crime tribunal. It, all peace situations also should be included where the crime has a transnational angle, 
So that should be the argument that should be coming about. For that you establish the jurisprudence. So your idea of universal jurisdiction right now is informed by Tokyo and Nuremberg tribunal experience or the Rwanda and others which are always linked with war. Cut that marriage of war and criminal crime tribunal in the International Court of Justice. Why can't it have a universal aspect even in non-war situations? Is the precise jurisprudential question you have to raise. And now a time will come with globalization and other things. Many more crimes which are otherwise dealt within the municipal law like money laundering, terrorism may have to have a larger angle. So we are just looking at the topic, not at literature review. But see, this insight when you are doing literature review will make your literature review really worth the investigation to uphold and to sustain your topic and put it on a new pedestal. So do you still think you have done a good job of your literature review? So do a good job, write a good thesis and report back to your guides. Good luck and thank you. and uh, connected to your theory.